Good morning, guys. You have a bunch of Texans lined up this morning with Roberts and Chelsea. My name is Dr. John Sego. I serve as a legislative uh, director for Texas Right to Life. I'm also a bioethicist, but my most notable uh, credential for you is that last year I was sued by the abortion industry 14 times. So I'm ready to retire. I feel like I've accomplished my career goal. I've been sued by Planned Parenthood. It feels great if you haven't had it yet. Uh, no, it, so it's a major career goal. <clears throat> Texas Right to Life, we, uh, we were honored to work uh, on the Texas Heartbeat Act. We worked alongside Senator Hughes, uh, state senator who championed that issue. Uh, we worked with Human Coalition, who was there with us in the Capitol. And uh, it was a, a great accomplishment. And while we're celebrating the Texas Heartbeat Act, some of our friends in the media uh, are not. Some of our friends, they, you might have realized, they have a different perspective about this life-saving bill. There's no shortage of shocking, almost apocalyptic headlines around the Texas Heartbeat Act. And most of the focus has been on this one unique aspect of the law. You can see that it will open up the door to unlimited lawsuits from strangers. Another headline reads that this bill creates anti-abortion vigilantes. That one impressed me. That one impressed me. Any anti-abortion vigilantes here this morning? Yes. The, the Texas Heartbeat Act, uh, it, it worked like many other heartbeat bills. About 13 other states had tried this before that it banned elective abortions at the point that the child's heartbeat is detectable by standard medical practice. However, it was unique in that it, and this is what gained the rage of the medium, is that it actually relied upon regular pro-lifers like you and me to hold the abortion industry accountable. It actually said that I don't allow our attorney general or our district attorneys or even our state agencies to enforce the law, but private citizens can hold the abortion industry accountable if we have evidence that they broke the law. <clears throat> yeah. And this was an innovative way to solve a problem that some thought was impossible, is that we actually in Texas enforced a bill that banned abortions before the point of viability. And a lot of people didn't think this was possible, and a lot of states didn't even try. But we had this huge success because of looking for a new approach, looking for bold creativity, and now the Supreme Court three times has said, no, we're gonna keep that bill in effect. And they just did it a few days ago. The Supreme Court <laughs> likes the law. And this creativity, this boldness, it has led to a situation where in Texas we are experiencing a preview of a post-row state. We're getting a glimpse of an abortion-free America. So for the last four months, we've seen that the abortion industry is forced to comply with this law. And time and time again, they've complained that the legal risks of them doing business as usual is too high. And so they've actually stopped doing abortions after six weeks in Texas. And a conservative estimate, just a second, a conservative estimate is that we have saved over 11,000 lives already in just four months. So it is in this landscape that te in Texas, we have seen these issues rise to the surface that pro-lifers knew were coming in the future, but we're here to say they're here now. Just like Chelsea was telling you, the post-Roe world is here. For example, we have lawless medical professionals and activists who are mailing abortion-inducing drugs into Texas in violation of multiple laws. We have apps and websites that are advertising to Texas women that they don't have to worry about any pro-life laws, that they can order abortion drugs directly into their dorm rooms. These challenges are going to require your innovation. These challenges facing us are going to require 
us to be bold in this new era. Slapping increased criminal penalties on these violations is not gonna work anymore. Going and demanding that our health department goes and inspects that brick and mortar Planned Parenthood down the road, that isn't gonna save any lives this time. To be clear, we have to be bold, but more than that, we need ideas. We need new approaches and novel pro-life activism. And just to make sure you're getting the point, the pro-life movement needs you. The pro-life movement needs your unique perspective. It needs your passion, and it needs your insight if we're going to face these new challenges. You, uh, what we do is that we need bioethicists and philosophers. We need policymakers and lawyers. We need IT guys and everything else. Your college campus needs your specific passion and ideas if you are a pre-med student or if you're a computer engineering major. After we passed the Texas Heartbeat Act, I was worried that the abortion industry was just going to ignore it because it didn't have the criminal penalties or administrative penalties. I was worried they were just gonna say, bring it, bring any lawsuits. We're just gonna keep on doing business as usual. And so what I did is we set up ProLifeWhistleblower.com, a website where regular citizens, if they had evidence that the abortion industry was breaking the law, that they could go and leave an anonymous tip or evidence of a violation. Well, little did I know, that would cause us to be sued 14 times by the abortion industry. And not only that, it actually put the crosshairs on our back from a group you may have heard of, an international hacktivist group named Anonymous and they led over a million attempted hacks of our website every single day. <laughs> One million hacks every day. If you don't know who Anonymous is, ask your nerdy friend who came to the march with you. They'll tell you. <laughs> One group of the unsung pro-life heroes from last year is our IT team who kept Anonymous from hacking our site every day. <laughs> pro-life IT guys. They were the heroes. We need new skills. We need novel approaches, not just to play defense against these things I've been talking about, but as this fight for life escalates, more and more new fronts of our battle are gonna be developing and they're going to be urgent. We need philosophers and thinkers to help us develop a pro-life position on some pretty difficult issues like, what do we do with artificial wombs? What's the pro-life position on that? That's being debated in bioethics right now. We need social workers and counselors to help us figure out how do we reach those women who are coming or making up their mind about their pregnancy earlier and earlier than ever. We need lawyers and policy nerds to look at how we can use tools like the ones being used in the opioid crisis how do we use those same tools to keep our communities from being flooded with abortion-inducing drugs? We need everyone in this room to help us with ideas of how we build up a pro-life society where pregnancy is not a disability, but it's actually an opportunity for flourishing and an opportunity for justice. We need everybody here. And right now, I've just been focusing on the fight for preborn children and their families and this doesn't even mention all of the other uh, issues threatening life, whether we look at assisted suicide or euthanasia or abortion uh, destroying research. These are areas the pro-life movement needs to be innovative. And we need you to do it. If you're interested in these topics, come talk to me. I'll be in the exhibit hall. But at Texas Right to Life, we want to encourage all of you, you're necessary. You're needed for this fight. My point is that the fight for life is evolving, and in order to face the challenges of our immediate future, we need to boldly innovate, and together, together with each and every one of you, all of your different perspectives, passions, majors, strengths, together, I'm confident that we will end elective abortion in our generation. Thank you. Yeah.